Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Loreen Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. Today we have a very special show, kind of in observation of National Mental Illness Awareness Week, which is October 4th through 20th. We have two gifted professionals, and we're going to talk about this most important subject that most people try to sweep under the carpet. Well, it's on top of the carpet here now. <laughs> and today we have Michelle Herling, who is the founder of the Compassionate Touch Network. And we have Senator Jerry Ortiz Pino, Democrat from Bernalillo County, who is chair of the Interim Legislative Health and Human Services Committee. And during the session, you're chair of the Powerful Public Affairs Committee. So we've got a two-pronged approach here, and we need it. So let's start with you, Michelle. Tell us what you, how you came to this work and uh, the approach that you take toward the, the, the issue of mental illness. I grew up with a brother who had a mental illness, and I came from a very large, extended, loving family, and we didn't have a clue as to what was going on. So our excuses for what was going on was, oh, he's idiosyncratic, it's a developmental stage. Um, and many other reasons that we thought that his behaviors weren't quite right. And it wasn't until he was 40 that he was actually diagnosed. And through those years, the stigma that he has faced, um, that I now can look back on and go, the stigma that he has faced because of his psychosis and because of his mental illness was so extreme that it motivated me to want to share stories with people, which is why Minds Interrupted came into being. So what is Minds Interrupted? It is a set of monologues. Seven people go on stage after writing their story, three people usually with an illness, and four people who have a family member with uh, who has a mental illness. And we've done these programs. We've actually done nine productions throughout New Mexico. So you've done Las Cruces. Your presenter was uh, Representative Paul Taylor, he a much beloved them. New Mexican. Um, Española, Los Alamos, Santa Fe, TRC. Las Caballo. Cru oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to go into some rural areas and see how this effective this program would be. And, uh, and it was incredibly inf effective. The feedback, we do post surveys, and the feedback was uh, really amazing. And so what you focus on, because it's a key challenge in every community, not just those ones that you've been in, to, to work at reducing the stigma associated with, with mental illness and to give a voice for the f caregivers and the patients and to just to bring it out into the open. Yes, we want them to, um, we want people with an illness and their families, because we were in hiding also as a family, we would like them to come out of the isolation and the shame um, that has gone along with mental illness. We work in the schools, uh, in middle and high school teaching lessons, and I share my story with youth um, with the hope that no other family will have to go through what my family mm -hmm. went through. Now, you, Senator, have been a social worker for how many years? Oh, <laughs> uh. 47? <laughs> so, since 1968, whatever that is. But we're so lucky to have you with that experience in the trenches to work in our legislature to try to help pass laws uh, to make all this better. You just had a week-long meeting in Albuquerque of the Interim Legislative Health and Human Services Committee. Can you tell us a little bit about what came out, what what happened in that meeting? Well, this was actually the third of a series of week-long meetings. We had one in Las Cruces. Uh, then we went to Roswell and Rui Doso, uh, took testimony two days in each. And then we were in Albuquerque this last week. And, and the picture that's emerging is what's happening now with our behavioral health system um, in New Mexico. And that, that's such a weird uh, a term. It's a, it's a blanket, an umbrella term that's come into into use over the last few years to encompass very different kinds of conditions, uh, alcoholism, drug addiction, and mental illness. 
and tried to use the same. There seems to be a kind of judgment in in, in well, there is in putting all of those them. together. In all of them, yeah, it, it's an attempt at, at making things simple administratively, but I think it's mix, mixed mm -hmm. up things at the field in the clinical area, and it's made it very difficult to find providers who are willing to deal with all three. Mm -hmm. The same resource and agency that might be very good at working with alcoholics might be hesitant to get involved in drug addiction and totally unprepared to deal with behavioral, with mental mm -hmm. health, mental mm -hmm. illness kinds of issues because they come from very different kinds. The theory behind them all is very different as well. So, you know, but whatever, our system, as you know, Lorreen was blown sky high two years ago when the Medicaid program decided that our 15 largest providers, some that were really good at one or another of those three things, were all guilty of fraud, were all condemned you know, instantaneously. Without due process, without being and able to face And that's slowly their been going through. The, but it, what, what, what it's left us with is two years of patchwork efforts. And some of the companies that were brought in from Arizona have left. And the southern tier of the state, this is what became so clear in Roswell and Las Cruces, has been largely unserved for the last six months. The state is trying to fill the gap. They're reaching out to primary care health clinics, uh, some of the federally qualified health centers, and asking them to take on behavioral health. But again, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, and, and they have certain things that'll make them very good, you know, their acceptance in the community and their long history in that community, but they haven't done it before. And just because they were primary care clinics doesn't mean they have any particular expertise or skill or, or sensitivity to the needs of the mentally ill or the drug addicted or the alcoholic. It's going to be a stretch. I don't know what other choice the state had at this juncture since we've blown the pre-existing agencies away uh, and the Arizona agencies couldn't make money, so they've gone back home. It's, um, it, it's, a, it's a, We're playing catch-up. And the picture that emerged from all three of our week-long meetings was of a system that is showing numbers that nobody believes. They just mm -hmm. don't believe that the same number of people are getting anywhere near the oh. same level of care as before. And yet the, the state is, is and, and I will say this, the state has made a big change in the last uh, year since the secretary changed. It's a different attitude. They're less confrontational, much more willing to talk. The new director of behavioral health for the Human Services Department has embarked on a strategic plan that seems to be reaching out to advocates and community members as well as to the HMOs. The heart of our problem is still that we're trying to make money on what is essentially not an industry. This is not a way to make money. And when you try to make money on it, you're going to leave people, if not underserved, deeply suspicious that they haven't gotten the best level of service. And I must say, the heart of the matter to me is that these are the most vulnerable patients that we have in yes. the state. Yes. These are, you know, teenagers in the throes of adolescent crises. These are addicts. These are, and to suddenly pull out whatever system they had working for them, and I, I know that the numbers were amazing. In Valencia County, there were 3,000 behavioral health patients, and then it went down to 1,000. Those people were yeah. not healed. That's right. The, no, no. And so they're out there somewhere in need of services. And um, the other injustice to me was that these companies who've been in business for 40, 50 years mm -hmm. were accused without being able to face the charges, without be being able to fix any errors that they may have been. It was just like it, out of business. It was, it was actually a very shocking, shocking event. And now we're trying to put the pieces back together. Yeah. So I'm happy that you, you're reporting to me that within the last year there have been some changes. I hope that we are made whole again in our treatment of these vulnerable people. It's going to take, but it'll take several years to, re I mean, everything we lost, now they're heading back and, and they're on the right track, I believe now, but it's going to take a lot of time to regain yeah. those things. Yeah. What Michelle is doing and her group is so important because you know, we, we haven't really been willing to deal with these issues in anything other than just saying, well, we'll let the insurance companies handle it, the HMOs. And if, it, if this proves anything, it's that you cannot simply take behavioral issues, mental health issues, and say, oh, the people that weren't uh, 
that we're treating them aren't aren't going to be treating them anymore. But we'll just bring in somebody else. The whole nature of the treatment, what they call treatment, is a relationship. Yeah, and, and you trust. can't just. It's like, well, I'm sorry, you, you know, your wife is gone. We'll just bring in a new wife for yeah. you. You can't <laughs> do that. It just doesn't work, unfortunately. Yeah. 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 Well said. <laughs> um, let's talk about. I people hear this and they think, well, what does that have to do with me? Let's. The national statistics, as I understand it, are one in five people in America. The one in five is diagnosed with a mental illness, but in New Mexico, we're one in four. If you look at a crowd, you look at a classroom, you look at a meeting, one in four of all those people is probably suffering from a diagnosed mental illness. And can you talk about the, the rate of children and, and some other statistics? I want people to realize that this is one of our most important problems. Adolescents, it's the same statistic. One in five across the nation, one in four here in New Mexico. So the statistics are incredibly staggering. Um, by the age of 14, 50% of uh, people with mental illness could, could be diagnosed, but some are and some are not, and three quarters by the age of 24. So these illnesses generally start early in life, and the symptoms start showing up. It doesn't mean that you have to leap to um, medication immediately. It just means that we have to pay attention, and we have to have some language that we can use rather than the language of stereotype, prejudice, and stigma. And let's stay on the issue of, of kids because your committee, the Legislative Health and Human Services Committee, this in 2015 chose to focus on kids and families. And you had some reports from some of the groups oh, that very very frightening to me, reports. Yeah, that. well, we spent uh, essentially we spent Friday talking about autism, and um, this is this is something that 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 I think shook all of us up just the scale of the problem uh, and, and just a quick comparison when I started in the legislature just 11 years ago they were using the figure of one in every 140 kids mm -hmm. born in the country will have autism will be diagnosed as somewhere having the some type of, of uh, some place on the spectrum uh, now they're saying one in every 68 children that's born today will be diagnosed in their lifetime as being at some place on that autism spectrum disorder. And we have very, very few resources to deal with it. Now I asked them, do you consider this, because the people from the Autism Society and the, and the various advocacy organizations and, and those few treatment resources that we have were there, do you consider this a behavioral health problem? And they hesitated because they know if we say this is a behavioral health problem, mm -hmm. they're going to be put into these same insurance packages mm -hmm. along with alcoholism and drug abuse and mental illness. And there are some features of autism that make it quite distinct from any of those. And, um, and so they hesitate, but yet they know that's all we've got. If they don't say, yes, mm -hmm. it is, then they're all out in left field dangling with no insurance company paying for any of that. It, 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 it's, a, it's a symptom of, of our system's inability to deal in an effective way with very different problems by trying to lump them all together as medical problems. And they're not necessarily medical problems. They're very different. Well, we're speaking today with Senator Jerry Ortiz Pino from Albuquerque and with Michelle Hurling. Thank you so much for joining us today talking about mental illness. So um, do you, I think you have a, a limit in your audience that you don't want because you tell seven such moving stories in, in Minds Interrupted that you encourage people to be like 13 or 14 up because... Anyone could hear one of the stories or two of the stories, but by the time you're hitting an eight-year-old with, with seven of these the very powerful stories. So um, that's in the audience end of the youth, but do you have young people actually delivering monologues about? We have a 19-year-old that um, presented at the Head to Toe conference. We were a keynote at Head to Toe this past year in Albuquerque. And uh, she is coming up to Santa Fe to share her story about her diagnosis of bipolar. 
Um, so 18 and 19 is the lowest range of age that we work with. And we work with 18 to 19 on up into 70 or 80 years old because depression in, in, in our elder years, is a hu there's a huge statistic there. Um, many, many older people uh, wind up uh, developing depression. So, and you had a whole section on the elderly too. Oh in, yes, that uh, was another. I was just <laughs> when she said the 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 uh, what do they call it a tsunami that they're expecting of people with Alzheimer's. As we're living longer, more and more are coming down with Alzheimer's. We're recognizing it, and diagnosing it more more rapidly. They're not dying of other illnesses, but then they wind up living for for in some instances for many years with with uh, all the symptoms of, of Alzheimer's and with the problems that it causes within the family. And then they, they have other illnesses as well. Uh, the incidence of depression and the incidence of, of, um, of uh, bipolar uh, you know, disorders where they're uh, up and sky high and excited one day and then in the depths the next day or very shortly thereafter. And the, all of these become very difficult for family members to contend with. Um, we have a, the issue that, that, that's facing us, frankly, is that we've paid for all of this with Medicaid. And unless it's considered a medical problem, Medicaid will not pay for it. So we've called all sorts of things medical mm -hmm. problems to get Medicaid money, which is wonderful. I mean, it's like, you know, state puts up 20% and the feds put up, you know, 80% and we can cover a lot more lives. But there are certain things that people with these problems need that Medicaid won't pay for. And we don't have any other way of paying for it. We've, we've put all of our eggs in that basket. Now we're slowly beginning to tease out the, 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 the need to find other resources, state funded. It's going to have to be state funded because the feds won't pay for it. Resources to cover these services like just support services and case management and somebody to to do outreach and to find them as they wander the streets or in sleeping in the parks and try to get them in those aren't considered medical necessity hmm. they're 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 oh that's a social service and we don't pay for social service well somebody's got to pay for it because that's what they need well one of the statistics that astonished me was that mental illness is the number one in causing disability more yeah, than any yeah, other illness, yeah, cancer, yeah. heart right. disease, anything. So there's a, if, if they're disabled enough to be on disability, that would certainly be a, an, an angle on the medical. But um, what, what, what do you see that your work can do to make us more aware of, of the complexities, the things he's talking about, yeah. respite care and- All and, of those, that's yeah. right. Very complex issues because we don't have um, we don't have tests we don't have blood tests we're beginning to start to see uh, of testing of brain imaging but even that things are not clear yet around that so it's really creating a lot of problems because we have to rely on symptoms and I think that there's a lot of stigma to illnesses that don't have the right tests or any tests that go with them. Yes, right. hmm. And and you know for for, um, for for many people it's the caregivers who bear the brunt of this. Yeah. That was the other thing we had a whole day on caregivers last week and a startling in, in fact came up that that your chances of coming down with a with a mental mm -hmm. illness yourself go way up if you've been spending many, many decades taking care of somebody with one of these severe problems. Uh. So that we need to do a much better job of providing the kinds of respite care or supportive services for the caregivers themselves. This is, this is incredibly, you know, we deinstitutionalized. Mm -hmm. And the theory was, we'll get them out of those horrible, medieval-looking institutions and they'll be cared for in community programs. Well, we've never... We've never developed the community programs that were supposed to replace it, and instead we've just left them either on the street on their own or more frequently dumped them back into the families that, that are struggling, that can't hold jobs because they've got to take care of this person, that, that can't sleep at night because they worry that they may be wandering the streets. Uh, all the, the, the pressures are being borne by the family caregivers, 
and we're offering very, very little in the way of supports. Gradually, as we become aware of it, more ideas are emerging, but, but we're just scratching the surface on the need. But I think education is going to be Perfect. really important yes. um, for us to be able to extend and expand those services. And that's one part of what Compassionate Touch Network is doing with youth, and we are beginning to expand into working with, uh, with adults, like at PTAs, um, at health conferences. Um, to just talk about mental illness like you would talk about any other illness. Our focus is just to break through the stigma and prejudice and stereotypes. Youth really get it. It's, it's really inspiring to be in a classroom and just have that conversation with the youth, to talk with them about symptoms of specific illnesses. And their favorite part is watching the celebrities. We bring slides of celebrities in as part of our PowerPoint. And they're shocked. Oh my gosh, Adam Levine has ADHD. Oh my gosh. Jim Carrey has depression. How can that be? Yeah. So or we Robin get, Williams, the and, most beloved comedian, yes. crushed with depression, yeah. Yeah. suicide. These yeah. are people that youth idolize um, and uh, really can relate to and can begin to start to take a look at their own family or themselves. Um, which is what our encouragement is. We have some wonderful school-based health centers here in Santa Fe, and we encourage youth, if you're feeling like something's going on, whether it's personally or with a friend or a family member, or whether you are um, worried uh, about yourself, um, whether you think you have a mental illness or not, go talk to somebody. They're bringing counselors on campus. You don't have to leave campus to talk to somebody. The, um, the, the idea of the school-based health centers as a way for reaching young people is, is terrific, I think, because it, it, it's a place where they're going to be able to go for help without having to immediately identify themselves as, mm -hmm. as different from the other kids. Uh, that is the single most uh, requested service at the school-based health mm. center statewide. Mm. Not condoms, not, uh, you know, uh, mm. uh, PE uh, class uh, physicals or sports uh, physicals, but actually behavioral health counseling. Kids who are feeling anxious, depressed, sometimes even suicidal, have a place to go when you have a school-based health center. And we need more of them. Um, I think there are only 52 in the state, something like yeah. that, you know, and, and there are a lot more high schools than that and an awful lot more school kids who could benefit from them than the ones that are able to use those right now. Well, we just have a few minutes left, and this is where I want to go with this. What can we do, you know, um, a normal person to, to just mm -hmm. s talk about not your crazy Aunt Mary in the attic, but the... the that you have a family member with mental illness, and it does take a village, actually, to help take care of, of our family members who are sick. And um, legislatively, should we active, should we lobby for more, more money to be put in the schools into this vulnerable teenage population? So talk to me about what you'd like our audience to look for, to be aware of, and to do. Do you want to take it? Well, we found from, from our youth that they just want to have somebody to talk to without being judged. And I think that for a, my brother is the same way as, as well as all of the people that I've worked with, um, with Minds Interrupted. So being able to have someone to speak to, being able to go see someone, a counselor or a therapist, um, if, if you feel like you need to, hearing people's stories, that's everything we do in Compassionate Touch. Our focus is story, whether it's visual or the written word. We have Inside Out Art Show coming up at the James Kelly and Time Modern Galleries, which is just artwork by people with mental illness because we want to make people with an illness visible. They're part of our community. They're part of the heart of our community. It's just, it just uh, really so important what, uh, what Michelle's group is doing, that is taking the, the shame away mm -hmm. from these conditions. 
for too long we've blamed the people with the condition. If you would just snap, you know, snap on, you know, just snap, just, just, you know, get a grip. Get a grip. Pull there. yourself up <laughs> by yourself. the loose straps. Yeah, you know, stop being so mopey. You know, it's, <laughs> it it really is is uh, uh, really important that 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 we 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 take it away from being uh, something that you've done wrong to being something that we can help with and that we can offer support to get past. Um, I think you know when you when we're looking at money that the legislature could spend. One of the simplest things we could do would be to expand our school-based health centers. Um, it, they're not inexpensive, but they're going to have payoff right away. Uh, another thing we could do would be to expand the use of home visitation programs. 82% of the babies born in this state, by the way, are born on Medicaid right now. 82%. Um. So all we would have to do would be to say, Medicaid... Perinatal services will now include three home visits or six home visits or whatever the department says they want to, to, to provide following the birth of a child mm. so that that mother, if she starts being depressed or she starts being, uh, you know, uh, so lonely or so uh, unsure of herself that she doesn't have any place to turn, could have somebody right there who could help her find the right resources immediately. That would be a simple thing, free of stigma, because everybody whose baby is born in Medicaid gets it. It's something you, you know, you get. Uh, you don't have to show symptoms in order to be able to get oh, it. That's a good idea. Um, so that would be another simple thing. That one, we're already paying for the Medicaid. That wouldn't cost us anything if they just expanded it. And in fact, it might save the HMOs money because they would also be picking up on health problems that could be headed off before they became serious and more expensive to treat. Well, thank you. Thank you both very, very much. I want to urge our our audience to think about going to Minds Interrupted, October 11th in Santa Fe. They can go to your website, www.mindsinterrupted.com. So thank you for what you do. Thank you, Lorraine. And Senator, Th oh yes, our guests today are Michelle Hurling and Senator Jerry Ortiz Pino. Thank you so much for what you do too, because it's a, a difficult arena that you go carrying these banners in, and uh, and you've done wonderful things, both of you. So thank you. Thank you, and it's, it was really great to see so many people around the state who are all focusing on this now. This is becoming a real high visibility concern in New Mexico. Well, we'll it'll stay visible for us too. Thank, thank you. you. And I'm Lorraine Mills. I'd like to thank you, our audience, for being with us today on Report from Santa Fe. We'll see you next week. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.